Hey there, I'm Claire Sam and super excited to be here. Uh, the reason I'm super excited to be here is I love food packaging and I get to share with you one of the really incredible advances in food packaging. And this has been going around on for a while, but we have some new innovations to share with you, new applications. And the cool thing about antimicrobial packaging is it really relates to, of course, food safety, right? Because we don't want to grow bad bugs and pathogens, but also relates to sustainability. Because if we use antimicrobial packaging, we have to use less um, what we call um, fossil-based packaging. So we'll talk through that. This is a little bit about me. I'm assuming uh, you don't want me to read through this, but basically I'm the owner of two different companies, uh, one of which is Packaging Technology and Research, and I'm also an adjunct professor at Michigan State, uh, and then I do all sorts of other things. If you're young in your career, I encourage you to do all sorts of these other things because, oh boy, it provides a great perspective and um, allows you to meet a lot of really interesting people. So I'm a firm believer and it's the synergies with engineering and with science that really create innovation. So the more people you network with uh, as a, a young person or an older person like me, the better because you can really tap into those synergies and make science very relevant in engineering. So this is what we do. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, preventing food waste, which is what antimicrobial packaging does. And then also talking about the lower quadrant here on the lower right, uh, really solving um, you know, the, the more sustainable packaging um, uh, puzzle. We'll also look a little bit about, we'll talk a little bit about screening uh, technologies. And then we'll also talk about tactical uh, implementation and uh, building in general knowledge all of which relate to cool engineering. This is what we do as a company. Um, my first love is packaging, and you know, it's unfortunate for my husband, but he does understand. So, um, and within packaging, it's food waste. And so uh, at the top here, going from left to right, and this is the way to think about this is the supply chain or the value chain. So starting on the, going from left to right, this is the, the food value chain. So we've got ingredients being sourced, right, which is a huge sustainability issue. And then going to the far right, we have consumers using those ingredients. In the case of packaging, we also have packaging being sourced. So fossil fuels, uh, we also have bio-derived packaging right now, use quite a bit. And then moving to the far right. What this chart shows you is the amount of food waste, or sorry, waste. So we have packaging waste on the bottom, and then we have food waste on the top. And yeah, there are some similarities. So we see a lot of food waste. We see a lot of packaging waste in the hands of consumers and the post-consumer environment for packaging. And then retailing is where we see a lot of uh, synergies between the two. Up in the upper right-hand corner, you have packaging solutions, hurrah for us and packaging. And then we have process uh, and um, product solutions like product development, sourcing ingredients differently. We hear a lot about that in the, the world of um, more sustainable um, food system when we hear about, uh, gosh, what is that called? The whole, um, the reuse of ingredients. So um, for example, a Nestle production plant will have some waste and then they use it again. Famous example of that is of course waste with protein concentrates, which is a byproduct of um, cheese production. So, and then we also have some value chain and system solutions. So value chain is a, a course I've been teaching and specifically the packaging value chain at Michigan State since 2005. And now I teach it at Cal Poly as well for about the past three years. So super cool, a lot of really cool solutions in the value chain. But today we're talking about antimicrobials and oh boy, there's a lot going on here, right? So this is the growth projected in, I believe, yep, 2021 of, of where the growth is gonna be. What's really cool is the growth in the, um, you know, the Asian, Eurasian region, a lot of growth in there. Why? Well, wow, there's a lot of people, right? And so, but we also see a tremendous amount of growth in what's kind of more mature economies, uh, you know, the, the global north. And um, the reason why is because antimicrobial technologies are really seen as a major solution to a lot of the problems we're facing uh, with more sustainable packaging um, in, in the global north, but then in the, the global south, as it's sometimes called, we also have major food safety and sustainability issues. Different parts of the value chain, but same issues. 
So we're not going to be able to cover all antimicrobial packaging today because it's an amazing huge field, but I'd like to touch on just a few of them. Uh, one is bacteriosins. Uh, the other one is uh, organic acid and derivatives, essential oils. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about metal-based uh, nanoparticles. And you've probably heard a lot about the silver ones in the press. And then we'll uh, end with antimicrobial polymers. And I'll touch on something that's kind of of interest these days, antiviral packaging. So packaging that resists the coronavirus. Imagine that. So uh, bacteriosins is the number one area really in antimicrobial packaging. So when we think about antimicrobial packaging, nicin is a really good place to start uh, because nicin has been around for a while. So I'm gonna use that as an example to explain what we do with antimicrobial packaging, but then I'll also hi highlight some specific things about it, of nicin. So nicin has been around, researched very extensively actually at Clemson. Uh, Dr. Crixey there has done some pioneer pioneering work perhaps about 15 years ago. So it's the only mass produced by bacteriosin. It's grass, which means generally recognized as safe by the FDA, which means you can use it in food. So it's been used um, unnoticed by the consumer, which is cool and fine. So we use it uh, to, um, to decrease the microbial load uh, of salmonella in products like chicken. And so we'll have uh, chicken breasts uh, put uh, within the package. So you have the polystyrene tray, put the chicken in, and then put the film on top, and then an overwrap film, right? The uh, edible film, or the, the film that degrades over time and uh, releases nicin into the product, can eliminate salmonella within seven days. So if you have a chicken, uh, chicken breast with a, a shelf life of, let's say, 21 days, you will be able to eradicate or remove salmonella from that chicken within that period of time. So it doesn't require a radiation to load or the microbial load, doesn't require modified atmosphere packaging, another solution we sometimes use, doesn't require uh, preservatives or um, natamycin or something like that that we might use. So this is pretty cool to be able to do that. So we've been using that actually in food packaging for um, maybe about 10 years, right? So consumers don't know about that, and that's okay, because it's um, kind of an odd conversation to have with consumers, because it's hard to communicate why you need antimicrobials, because then they say, gosh, there's microbes in there? Well, there were before. So uh, we've been able to extend the shelf life of food uh, without adding any more packaging. So that's really golden. So this is widely used. Uh, cheese is another really good example of this, and um, you know, yogurts and like that. So in packaging or in food science, we have gram positive and gram negative uh, bacteria. These are some of the issues associated with it. So it's not really effective against gram negative bacteria, but it's super effective against gram positive bacteria. The gram positive bacteria that we really worry a lot about is salmonella. You've probably heard a lot about salmonella associated often with chicken, eggs, things like that. So one of the other issues that we see with nicin is the, oops, sorry, the uh, incorporation uh, of, of it, you know, may form large clusters. And we see this when we try to incorporate nanotechnology within um, uh, polymers as well. So it's also common with things like nicin, which is basically an enzyme and it's a protein. And this is a problem that we also have with other antimicrobials we're going to talk about. And so it's a function of the aspect ratio, which you may have heard about with, with nanotechnologies. And so we have to be really careful about where we place the nicin uh, and how we place the nicin. If it's all clumped together, less efficacy, right? So uh, as of with nanotechnology, we don't want the little nanoparticles to, to bunch up because then they don't... Um, perform like nanoparticles. So with nicin, we also want them to spread out. Also with nicin, because we're trying to release this antimicrobial into the food, we want to have it right at the edge of the polymer and on the food contact uh, interface. And so we have to really focus on polymer science uh, in order to do things like that. So fortunately in polymer science, we have a lot of other compounds and we call it blooming. So we want those compounds to remain on the outside, uh, and in this case, the food contact layer. So we're able to use that same type of technology with nicin. Super cool. 
So we also have another problem with niacin uh, is that you know some type of enzymes and, and things like that may degrade niacin. Like, oh gosh, where would we have the titanium dioxide, Claire? Really? Well, sometimes we use that uh, as a whitening agent in our food products, but then we also see that in packaging. So amazing uh, efficacy with niacin. We add it as a surface coating. That's what I was talking about with the blooming on polyethylene, linear low density polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, nylon, polyethylene terephthalate, which we associate with a uh, soda bottle, uh, and polyvinyl chloride, which is of course being phased out. So these are some examples of how we've seen the efficacy of uh, niacin being just phenomenal. One of the other really bad pathogens out there is Listeria monocytogenes. So that's in the second bullet point. And so niacin has been really effective against this with things like hot dogs, oysters. Oh, boy, is that a problem, right? So typically with oysters, we'll even irradiate or high pressure process over oysters so we can lower the microbial load so that the product will last longer as well as be more safe. But if we use niacin, we don't have to do that extra processing step, saves the processor money, but then also um, extends the shelf life, right? So super cool stuff going on with niacin. So the next area, so I skipped over a lot of those other bacteriosins, but I really wanted to highlight uh, niacin. And so I hope you get the context here. So these are a lot of organic acids. Uh, sometimes you'll see these as ingredients. So you see sorbic acid in um, a lot of liquid products. Uh, you'll see sorbates in a lot of liquid products, uh, benzoic acid, things like that. The one that's really doing well in uh, edible packaging or edible antimicrobial packaging is uh, C8 to C12. So these are fatty acid chains. And so we're gonna focus on talking about those. A lot of you have probably heard about the appeal technology. They're doing an amazing job marketing this stuff, and that's why. But frankly, we're talking about fatty acids. Well, what's a fatty acid? So these are the low molecular weight fatty acids. So C8 to C12 means that it's uh, got a chain length of eight to 12, right? So these are the ones at the low end. So this is uh, palmitic acid, for example, has a chain length of 16. Steric acid, commonly associated with soap, has the chain length of 18. So we're talking lower molecular weight, but we have been coating acids, uh, fatty acids and waxes on products for years, right? So waxed apples, right? oranges, things like that. That's been to retard moisture, right? But these ones that are the lower molecular weight, like lauric acid, are much uh, more effective as antimicrobial agents than on the ones that are higher, like palmitic and steric acid that I mentioned. So we'll see palmitic and steric acid and, and maybe even um, you know, oleic acid and things like that used as coatings to retard moisture transfer. These fatty acids that are down on the lower part, uh, antimicrobials, so pretty cool. Um, we've all heard about trans fatty acids and, and not trans fatty acids, but you know the efficacy changes. So we really wanna have the cis form of these fatty acids, which is the form that's um, one side of um, the uh, the carbon-carbon bond, a cis is on the top, and, uh, or a cis is um, you know a different orientation than the trans. So we've got to stick with it in the natural state. So very rarely do these come from hydrolyzed uh, fatty acids. Pretty cool though. A lot of really neat research. Um, the appeal group is not necessarily pioneered a lot of this group. If you dig back into the research, you find all sorts of information. For example, lauric uh, arginate and lauric alginate films. Um, so we can put this into uh, polypropylene and zane, which is a corn-based film kind of similar to PLA. And it can retard the growth of Listeria monocytogenes and the nasty E. coli that commonly we associate, uh, though we're seeing it more, with uh, ground beef. But we're also seeing this now with uh, lettuce and uh, things like that. So it's pretty cool. One of the ways that this is really becoming effective is with fruits and vegetables, uh, kind of like the last line of defense. Um, so we don't want to use antimicrobial technology and packaging to. Um, allow for really bad processing, right? To allow for unclean processing or, or not follow hazard analysis, critical control points and food safety. We don't wanna use it that way. But 
we want to use it as the last line of defense to extend the shelf life, less food waste, and to protect consumers in a safe, uh, in a safe manner. So the next one we're going to talk about, super cool, uh, and there is a lot of research going on, on in this area. So if you are trying to figure out an area to research, um, exploring different areas of uh, you know, food science and the juxtaposition of polymer science and food science and, and where things are going, there's a lot of really cool research going on in this area. So we're going to go through um, the essential uh, oils, and then we're going to go through some extracts. So I'm going to give couple examples, because uh, we have limited amount of time. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, thyme oil, and then I think I'm going to talk about grapefruit uh, seed extract. So super cool stuff going on. So when you look at these, it's like, gosh, there's a lot of spices in here, right? So obviously cinnamon would not be super good to use with, uh, let's say, chicken. But cinnamon is actually used as an antimicrobial integrated into the underside of the package with things like hmm, cinnamon rolls. So that makes sense. So cinnamon can actually be used as a really powerful antimicrobial and totally not objectionable with something like cinnamon rolls. Right? Basil and rosemary, we see that a lot with marinades. So we'll see a chicken marinade uh, prepackaged uh, and on the underside of the package, it'll be uh, enrobed uh, for release into the product with basil and rosemary. Very cool. So let's talk about how long they've been around and some, some pretty neat innovations here. So were there a lot of essential oils? And that's why this is a pretty super cool area for research. Uh, 300 though have commercial value, but gosh, that's a lot, right? One of the neatest things about them, which we're not really talking about here is some of them have antioxidant capability as well as the antimicrobial, which we're talking about today. Antioxidant capability is really powerful. We see antioxidants as BHA and BHT, most commonly in cereal bags. The antioxidant BHA and BHT um, can migrate out of low-density polyethylene, interact with the cereal, and reduce lipid oxidation, which is one of the biggest problems in, that we deal with in food packaging. And it can do it without needing a high barrier. It can do it without, uh, so you could have a monolayer layer. Uh, recyclable structure as opposed to a high barrier and other modified atmosphere packaging solutions. So it also saves companies money. So super cool stuff going on in this area. So mo most of the antimicrobial effect, at least with essential oils, is due to the separating lipid con constituents from the bacterial cell membranes. And what it does then is they're unable to actually act. So that's the efficacy uh, mechanism. So pretty cool. One of the issues though, is you really got to stay down to a low concentration level, unless you have something like cinnamon with cinnamon rolls, and then you really don't you care. You can go up to a higher concentration level, but you wouldn't again, want to have something like clean cinnamon flavored uh, chicken. That might be good. The one we're going to talk about is thyme. So rosemary and thyme, something we all love to have is thyme. And so, boy, efficacy against this really nasty one, which we see a lot in the press, E. coli. Staph aureus is another one we see, commonly associated with maybe the fast food industry and uh, behind the counter delis. Uh, that's usually because of human contact, um, some type of um, components from our skin. Uh, maybe we've touched our hair or something like that. And then we do food prep. So, mm, yes, that does happen. But so time can be effective against that. Uh, we also see it in seafood, and oh boy, that is really powerful, right? Increasing the shelf life for four days, you may say, well, gosh, Claire, that's not much, but that's huge. If we can increase the shelf life on bluefish from nine to, to 14 days, we can probably decrease food waste in that category by 15 to 20%. Retailers love that. They can have the product out longer, right? Uh, and then you, as a consumer, it's going to stay fresher longer in your refrigerator. And again, without synthetic preservatives, uh, without extra packaging and, and things like that. So this is something we can incorporate into the existing package. So it's, it's very nice. Uh, and then um, again, swordfish, 0.2% uh, solution. So we're not talking about high levels of time. But again, if you're already adding time to your product, you could add a little bit more. The other one uh, for extracts, we're going to talk about grapefruit seed extract. 
holy the smokes. So if you just take a step back and you think grapefruit seeds, hmm, what do we do with those otherwise, right? So when I eat grapefruit, hmm, what do I do with the seeds? Well, I toss them out. But, you know, that's me as a person, but we also have, you know, the grapefruit juice industry, right? They don't use the seeds. And so this is using basically food waste, grapefruit seeds, and getting the extract out of them. And these extracts are really powerful. Uh, and the antimicrobial activity in this case is due to all these compounds, right? Um, and so that's pretty cool. So that's one of the things we think about a lot when we think about essential oils and essential extracts. And that's why it's a really fun area of research is because you can take these byproducts of food waste and get value from them. There's also one on uh, grape seed extracts, not just grape fruit seed extracts. So different types of compounds uh, can be extracted that can uh, impart antimicrobial activity. So really high heat stability here. So that's amazing. So we can couple that with, let's say a hot fill application, which is really nice. Um, uh, and most natural extracts are considered grass. That's the generally recognized as safe by the FDA. Uh, different rulings in the EU with IFSA and, and of course internationally, but um, we're not gonna get into too much detail on that, but that's a neat area because essential oils and natural extracts are generally approved uh, by the EU. Although with a lot of these, it's, it's up to a certain level, right? So here are some really neat research results. Low density polyethylene, that's uh, nylon is the uh, polyamide, and that was with grapefruit seed extract, reduced the growth of anaerobic bacteria, sorry, aerobic bacteria and coliforms on packaged ground beef. Is that a problem? Yes, right? So the ground beef that you buy in uh, little packages at the store, maybe one pound packs, that is exposed. Uh, it's not It's not at 0% oxygen. So that's breathing and um, growing uh, bacteria, right? So we can retard the growth of that with something simple like a grapefruit seed extract. Later on, we're going to talk a little bit about chitosin. Uh, chitosin is actually a polymer. And so we can put grapefruit seed extract and combine it with chitosin. Huh. Interesting. So we take the efficacy of grapefruit seed extract, which is a little bit different than chitosin, combine it with chitosin, and we can have an antimicrobial on an antimicrobial film. Super cool. This is one that's been around for a while. So we've seen this in the press um, with silver, uh, most commonly. And there's issues, of course, uh, with nanotechnology and silver. Uh, and uh, with, of course, copper. Uh, we're not going to talk about copper here because not so hot with food. <laughs> but with silver, we see major concerns, uh, more common with textiles and things like that. But silver is an amazing antimicrobial. You, you know, if you get your ears pierced or piercings, it'll be a silver that they'll, they'll want you to put in your ears or, or wherever you get pierced because it's a natural antimicrobial until the, the hole is set and things like that. So we can use that in packaging. The issue is though, if the packaging is inappropriately disposed of, if it's degradable, things like that, that silver comes out of the package and mm, lands wherever it lands, right? So a problem with textiles, um, things coming out in the wash, you know, and things like that. So uh, there are very strict and increasingly strict regulations on nanotechnology and silver with packaging. Uh, but one of the opportunities here that's huge is zinc oxide. Hmm, take a step back, think about zinc oxide. It's very interesting. So zinc oxide is actually um, generally recognized as safe. So we'll talk a little bit more about zinc, zinc oxide in a second. This is a nice overview of the, the nanotechnology and nanoparticles that are out there with metal ions. So this is what I alluded to earlier, the REACH, which is Registration, Evaluation, Authorization of Chemicals. Very common um, legislation and been around for quite some time in the EU, associated with IFSA, associated with all sorts of European norm regulations and things like that. Most companies are actually complying with that legislation because we have global food companies and we have global packaging companies. So just because we don't have legis legislation in the United States or rules about that in the United States, 
companies are actually following uh, those types of legislation. So it is important to look at what the rest of the world is doing and specifically the EU in terms of that. So let's talk about zinc oxide, super cool. Uh, amazing stuff actually, uh, considered grass by the FDA. Wow, hmm. Now there are limits in terms of how much we can use. There are a lot of companies working in this space. So if I, I uh, looked at this maybe about six months ago, and so these were the companies then, I would probably add about three more if I did a recent search. So a lot of activity going on. Um, incorporating zinc into concentrates, into plastic films, um, it's just amazing uh, types of advances in this area. Also thinking about uh, specific applications in the United States. We have a client um, that we worked with a, a couple of years ago introducing zinc oxide into, uh, into packaging components. And one of the things we did for them is determine which areas and which types of products that they would be more effective against. And so we look at it from a competitive standpoint and say, well, gosh, you'd be competing against time uh, you know, grapeseed extract, you know, things like that in these categories. You'd be competing against silver, which we know is going out in these categories. Well, that's an amazing opportunity. So we size the market for them, look at all these different competitive uh, threats that they could have, and then uh, help them uh, on their implementation path. So that's actually a process, which is why I'm talking about it in vague terms. So I'm not authorized to talk in specific terms. So let's talk about the neat one, antimicrobial polymers. What's going on here, Claire? Kind of weird. So these are polymers you can actually consume. So most of these polymers, uh, well, some of them we've talked about, uh, you can put antimicrobial agents into polymers that you can eat, right? That are food-based, right? So I'm not talking about PLA, which you wouldn't want to eat. I'm talking about Zane films films made out of corn and food grade ingredients. Uh, methyl cellulose is another one that you can, you can eat if it's made out of food grade ingredients. Whey protein isolate films, that type of thing. But chitosin is actually a film former, it, it forms a film and as is polylysine, but it's antimicrobial and it's consumable. So it hits all those buttons, definitely worth talking about. Antifungal, antibacterial, wow, and golden it's grass, right? So there's a lot of different mechanisms of uh, what, it, um, what it can work on. This last one is really interesting. Right? So it, it heal, it's uh, essential trace minerals. And so chitosan actually has antioxidant capability as well. So we talked about why that's really important. You have unsaturated fatty acids like we did in the cereal example I gave you. Wow, you can uh, retard lipid oxidation, which is cool. So you can have, a, you have an antimicrobial film that's also an antioxidant film. And yes, there's a lot of really cool research going on in this area. So we can actually have um, chitosan incorporated into synthetic or other bio-based polymers. So you could have uh, bio-derived polyethylene, right? Which is, which is out there. Uh, bio-derived PET, where you take bio-derived ethylene glycol and bio-derived um, terephthalic acid and you could put a coating of bio-derived uh, chitosan on it. So it can be an entirely bio-derived structure and then antimicrobial in this case. So really some neat opportunity. It is derived from shellfish. People like me would be concerned about that because I have a very severe shellfish allergy. So there are some issues with it. It is extremely water sensitive, uh, low mechanical strength, low thermal stability. How does that relate to what we want to do in packaging? Well, we really want to seal things in packaging generally. And sometimes if they're in a truck zooming around the country, especially in the southern part of the United States or in warm regions, those trucks can get up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit to 160 degrees Fahrenheit in the summertime. So, ooh, if it has low thermal stability, that's a problem. But with something like chitosan, we actually want to release that antimicrobial property. So it's okay. You've got the polyethylene film uh, for some, uh, you know, very firm substrate. So, you know, it's, it's good and it's bad. Here's some really neat research. So chicken drumsticks, we talked about that before with nicin, but we've got extruded chitosan with low density polyethylene film. That's like a bread bag. 
um, lower mesophilic, which is the medium range of bacteria, chloroforms, yeast, mold, oof, huge problem in the packaging. And then um, we also can have, you know, the competitive thing here, this is really interesting. So the control in this case was low density polyethylene films coated with nicin. So that was one control. A low density polyethylene films with potassium sorbate, the silver we alluded to earlier, and then just low density polyethylene films. So this was much more effective. Don't have the nicin issue, which tends to be high cost. Potassium sorbate, you know, preservative. Silver, we've got issues with that with the environment. And then of course the control, nothing. So pretty neat efficacy. Some of the microbes that we're talking about efficacy against are, you know, bacillus, uh, salmonella, uh, E. coli, and so extremely uh, high efficacy. This is one that it's often combined with. So we have um, a chitosin and a polylysine film. Pretty interesting going on, right? Things going on, right? So you can kind of match the chitosin activity with um, polylysine. Or you could do what we were talking about before with nicin on chitosin, right? You could talk, uh, you could have something like rosemary with chitosin. And so you can mix and match. So chitosin is becoming the new platform, if you will, uh, onto which we put other antimicrobials because it just makes a lot of sense. And again, chitosin wouldn't be just a standalone polymer. Maybe in the case of what I was talking about with chicken, uh, with embedded uh, nicin, and then it would, um, in a high moisture chicken, high water activity environment, it would dissipate into the chicken. But eh, that's not always the application we need. Sometimes we would actually need the film to, to stay together. And so we would put it on the underside of low density polyethylene. And so chitosin would be in direct contact with the food. The last area, obviously of interest uh, lately uh, is antiviral packaging. So that's something extremely interesting. Um, so silver uh, is very effective, right? We talked about some of the issues, copper, very effective. Zinc actually is also effective. And so zinc has a tremendous pop, um, promise here. So there's a lot of studies that were done uh, when coronavirus was, um, um, frankly, it's still being learned about and, and things like that. And so people were putting their packages outside their door, their businesses for 48 hours, uh, contact uh, with paperboard, uh, things like that. You know, how, how long can it live on paperboard or corrugated uh, polyethylene, metal, glass, you know, things like that. And there are numbers on that. So it was a, a major concern. But if we have uh, antiviral packaging, uh, then we can reduce the degree to which viruses can transfer. So that's an amazing opportunity uh, and certainly uh, advances are happening quite rapidly. So this is what we talked about. Oof, a lot going on. So when I spoke about bacteriosins, I just spoke about nicin. There's a whole host of other ones. When I spoke about essential oils and natural extracts, I just talked about rote or thyme and grapeseed extract. There was a whole host of other ones. Metals, I focused on zinc. Right, and antimicrobial properties, touched a little bit about the, um, uh, the lysine or polylysine, but primarily focused on chitosin and, and didn't even talk about volatile gas antimicrobials, some cool stuff going on there with citric acid and chlorine. Uh, and then we touched just a little bit on antiviral packaging. So super cool area of research in polymer engineering. That's all I have for you today, but uh, please reach out. I believe somewhere in this uh, website, you'll be able to uh, get my email. Uh, or web address and uh, love to hear from you. Thank you for your time.